Welcome back everyone to theCUBE and Horizon 3.ai special presentation. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here with Chris Hill, Sector Head for Strategic Accounts and Federal at Horizon 3.ai. Uh, great innovative company. Chris, great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Yeah, like I said, uh, you know, great to meet you, John. L long time listener, first time caller. So excited to be here with you guys. Yeah, we were talking before camera, you at Splunk back in 2013. And I think 2012 was our first Splunk.com. Yep. And boy, man, you know, Talk about being in the right place at the right time. Now we're at another inflection point and Splunk mm -hmm. continues to be relevant um, and continuing to have that data driving security and that interplay and your CEO, former CTO of Splunk as well at Horizon, Sneha, we, who's been on before. Really innovative product you guys have, but you know, yeah. don't wait for a breach to find out if you're logging the right data. This is the topic of this right. thread. Splunk is very much part of this new international expansion announcement. Uh, with you guys, tell us, what are some of the challenges that you see where this is relevant for the Splunk and the Horizon AI as you guys expand uh, uh, Node Zero out internationally? Yeah, well, so ac across, so, you know, my role uh, within Splunk uh, was uh, working with our most strategic accounts. And so I look back to 2013 and I think about the, the sales process, like working with, with our Splunk customers, you know, it was, um, it was still very siloed back then. Like I was selling to an IT team that was either using us for IT operations. Um, we generally would always even say, yeah, although we do security, we weren't really designed for it. We're a log management tool. And, you know, we, and I'm sure you remember back then, John, we were like sort of stepping into the security space and in the public sector domain that I was in, you know, security was 70% of what we did. When I look back to sort of, uh, the transformation that I was witnessing in that digital transformation, um, you know, when I you look at like 2019 to today, you look at how uh, the IT team and the security teams are being, have been forced to break down those barriers that they used to sort of be silent away, would not communicate one. You know, the security guys would be like, oh, this is my box, IT, you're not allowed in. Today, you can't get away with that. And I think that the value that we bring to, you know, and of course Splunk has been a huge leader in that space and continues to do innovation across the board. But I think what we've, we're seeing in the space, and I was talking with Patrick Coughlin, the SVP of um, uh, security markets about this, is that, you know, what we've been able to do with Splunk is build a purpose-built solution that allows Splunk to eat more data. So Splunk itself, as you well know, is an ingest engine, right? So it, the great reason people bought it was you could build these really fast dashboards and grab intelligence out of it. But without data, it doesn't do anything, right? So how do you drive and how do you bring more data in? And most importantly, from a customer perspective, how do you bring the right data in? And so if you think about what um, Node Zero and what we're doing at Horizon 3 is that, sure, we do pen testing, but because we're an autonomous pen testing tool, we do it continuously. So this whole thought of being like, oh, crud, like my customers, oh yeah, we got a pen test coming up. It's going to be six weeks to wait. Oh yeah, you know, and everyone's going to sit on their hands. Call me back in two months, Chris. We'll talk to you then, right? Not, not a real efficient way to test your environment. And shoot, we, we saw that with Uber this week, right? Um, you know, and that's a case where we could have helped. Well, just real right? quick, we just explain the Uber thing because it was a contractor. Just give a quick highlight of what happened so you can connect the dots. Yeah, no problem. So um, there, it was, a, a, I think it was a, yeah, one of those, uh, you know, um, games where they would try and test an environment. Um, and what the uh, pen tester did was he kept on calling them MFA guys, being like, I need to reset my password. We need to set my password. And eventually the um, customer service guy said, okay, I'm resetting it. Once he had reset and bypassed the multi-factor authentication, he then was able to get in and get access to the domain area that he was in, or the not the domain, but he was able to gain access to a part of, partial part of the network. He then paralleled over to what would I assume is like a VA, VMware or some virtual machine that had notes that had all of the credentials for logging into various domains. And so within minutes, they had access. And that's the sort of stuff that we do. Under, you know, a lot of these tools like, um, not, it, I'm not, it, it, you know, you, you think about the cacophony of tools that are out there in a ZTA architecture, right? I'm going to get like a Zscale or I'm going to have uh, Okta. I'm going to have a Splunk. I'm going to need a SOAR system. I mean, I don't mean to name names. You're going to have CrowdStrike or, or, or Sentinel-1 in there. It's just, it's a cacophony of things that don't work together. They weren't designed to work together. And so we have seen so many times in our business through our customer support and just working with customers when we do their pen tests that, there will be 5,000 servers out there 
three are misconfigured. Those three misconfigurations will create the open door. Because remember, the hacker only needs to be right once. The defender needs to be right all the time. And that's the challenge. And so that's why I'm really passionate about what we're doing uh, here at Horizon 3. I see this my digital transformation, migration, and security going on, which uh, we're at the tip of the spear. It's why I joined Sayhaw coming on this journey uh, and just super excited about where the path's going and super excited about the relationship with Splunk. I can get into more details on some of the specifics of that, but... Um, you know, well, I mean, you're, well, you're nailing it. I mean, we've been doing a lot of things around super cloud and this next gen environment, we're calling it next gen. You're really seeing DevOps, obviously DevSecOps is, has, has already won. The IT role has moved to the developer. Shift left is an indicator of that. It's one of the many examples. Higher velocity code, software supply chain. You hear these things. That means that IT is now in the developer hands. IT is replaced by the new ops, data ops teams and security, where there's a lot of horizontal thinking to your point about access. There's no more perimeter. So there's there huge, no perimeter. huge, 100% right is really right on. I don't think it's one time, you know, to get in there. Once you're in, then you can hang out, move around, move laterally, big problem. Okay, so we get that. Now the challenge is for these teams as they are transitioning organizationally, how do they figure out what to do? Okay, this is the next step. They already have Splunk. So now they're kind of in transition while protecting for 100% ratio of success. So how would you look at that and describe the challenges? What do they do? What, is the, what are the teams facing with their data? And what's next? What, are they, what, are they, what action do they take? So let's use some vernacular that folks will know. So if I think about DevSecOps, right? We both know what that means, that I'm going to build security into the app. But no one really talks about Sec DevOps. Right? How am I building security around the perimeter of what's going inside my ecosystem and what are they doing? And so if you think about what we're able to do with somebody like Splunk is we can pen test the entire environment from soup to nuts, right? So I'm going to test the endpoints through to IT. So I'm going to look for misconfigurations. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to look for um, uh, credentials, exposed credentials. You know, I'm going to look for anything I can in the environment. Again, I'm going to do it at, at light speed. And, and what, we're, what we're doing for that sec DevOps space is to, you know, did you detect that we were in your environment? So did we alert Splunk or the SIM that there's someone in the environment laterally moving around? Did they, more importantly, did they log us into their environment? And when did they detect that log to trigger that log? Did they alert on us? And then finally, most importantly for every CISO out there is going to be, did they stop us? And so that's how we we, we do this. And I think you, uh, when speaking with um, Stay Hall before, you know, we've come up with this um, boils OODA loop, but we call it find, fix, verify. So what we do is we go in as we act as the attacker, right? We act in a production environment. So we're not going to be, a, we're a passive attacker, um, but we will go in uncredentialed, unagent, but we have to assume, have an assumed breach model, which means we're going to put a Docker container in your environment, and then we're going to fingerprint the environment. So we're going to go out and do an asset survey. Now that's something that's not something that Splunk does super well, you know, so can Splunk see all the assets, do the same assets marry up? We're going to log all that data and they can then put, uh, load that into the Splunk SIM or the Splunk logging tools just to have it in enterprise, right? That's an immediate future ad that they've got. Um, and then we've got the fix. So once we've completed our pen test, um, we are then going to generate a report. And we can talk about these in a, a little bit later, but the reports will show an executive summary, the assets that we found, which would be your asset discovery aspect of that, a fix report. And the fix report, I think, is probably the most important one. It will go down and identify what we did, how we did it, and then how to fix that. Um, and then um, from that, the pen tester or the organization should fix those. Then they go back and run another test and then they validate through like a change detection environment to see, hey, did those fixes take place? And you know, Sneha, when he was the CTO of JSOC, he shared with me a number of times about, he's like, man, there would be 15 more items on next week's uh, punch sheet that we didn't know about. And it's, and it has to do with how we, you know, how they were, uh, prioritizing the CVEs and whatnot because they would take all yeah. CVDs was critical or non-critical. And it's like, 
we are able to create context in that environment that feeds better information into Splunk and whatnot. Well, that, that, was a that, brings, that brings up the, the, the efficiency for Splunk, specifically the teams out there. By the way, the burnout thing is real. I mean, this whole, I just finished my list and I got 15 more or whatever the list just can, keeps, keeps growing. How did Node Zero specifically help Splunk teams be more efficient? Like, that's the question I want to get at because this yeah. seems like a very scalable way for Splunk customers and teams, service teams, to be more efficient. So the question is, how does Node Zero help make Splunk, specifically their service teams, be more efficient? So, to, so today, in our early interactions with building with Splunk customers, what we've seen are five things, um, and I'll start with sort of identifying the blind spots. Right. So. Kind of what I just talked about with you. Did we detect? Did we log? Did we alert? And did they stop node zero? Right. And so I would I put that in, you know, a, a, a more layman's third grade term. And I, I, if I was going to beat a fifth grader at this game, would be we can be the sparring partner for a Splunk enterprise customer, a Splunk Essentials customer, um, someone using uh, Splunk Soar, or even just an enterprise Splunk customer that may be a small shop with three people and, and just wants to know where am I exposed. So by creating and generating these reports and then having um, the API that actually generates the dashboard, they can take all of these events that we've logged and log them in. And then where that then comes in is number two, is how do we prioritize those logs, right? So how do we create visibility to logs that um, are have critical impacts? And again, as I mentioned earlier, not all CVEs are high impact, Regard and also not all are low, right? So if you daisy chain a bunch of low CVEs together, boom, I've got a mission critical AP uh, CVE that needs to be fixed now, such as a credential moving to an NT box that's got a text file with a bunch of passwords on it. That would be very bad. Um, and then third would be uh, verifying that you have all of the hosts. So one of the things that Splunk's not particularly great at, and they, they'll admit themselves, they don't do asset discovery. So do, what assets did we see and what are they logging from that? Um, and then for, from, um, for every event that they are able to identify, one of the cool things that we can do is actually create this low-code, no-code environment. So they could let, you know, Splunk customers can use Splunk SOAR to actually triage events and prioritize that events or where they're being routed within it to optimize the SOX team time to market or time to triage any given event, obviously reducing MTR. And then finally, I think one of the neatest things that we'll be seeing us develop is um, our ability to build glass tables. So behind me, you'll see one of our triage events and how we build a, a, a Lock, Lockheed Martin kill chain on that with a glass table, which is very familiar to the Splunk community. We're going to be, have the ability in the not too distant future to allow people to search, observe on those IOCs. And if people aren't familiar with an IOC, um, it's an incident of compromise. So that's a vector that we want to drill into. And of course, who's better at drilling into data than Splunk? Yeah, this is a critter, this is an awesome synergy there. I mean, I can see a Splunk customer going, man, this just gives me so much more capability, action, actionability, and also real understanding. And I think this is what I want to dig into, if you don't mind, understanding that critical impact, okay, is kind of where I see this coming. We've got the data, data ingest, now data is data, but the question is what not to log, you know, where are things misconfigured? These are critical questions. So can you talk about what it means to understand critical impact? Yeah, so I think, you know, going back to the, the things I just spoke about, a lot of those CVEs where you'll see, um, uh, low, 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 and then you daisy chain together, and you're suddenly like, "Oh, this is high now." But then to your other impact of like, if you're a if you're a, a Splunk customer, you know, and I had I had several of them. I had one customer that you know terabytes of McAfee data being brought in, and it was like, "All right, there's a lot of other data that you probably also want to bring," but they could only afford wanted to do certain data sets because that's and they didn't know how to prioritize or filter those data sets. And so we provide that opportunity to say, hey, these are the critical ones to bring in, but there's also the ones that you don't necessarily need to bring in because low CVE in this case really does mean low CVE. Like an ILO server would be one that, um, that's the uh, print server uh, where the uh, your admin credentials are on, on like a, a printer. And so there will be credentials on that. That's something that a hacker might go in to look at. So although the CVE on it is low, 
If you daisy chain with somebody that's able to get into that, you might say uh, that's high. And we would then potentially rank it, giving our AI logic to say that's a moderate. So put it on the scale and we prioritize low versus a, a vulnerability scanner is just going to give you a bunch of CVEs and good luck. And, and translating that, if I if I can, and tell me if I'm yeah. wrong, that kind of speaks to that whole lateral movement uh, that's it. challenge, right? Print server, great example. Looks stupid, low end, who's going to want to deal with the print server? Oh, but it's connected into a critical system. There's a path. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, I use daisy chain. I think that's from the community they came from, uh, but it's, it's just a lateral movement. It's exactly what they're doing. And those low level, low critical lateral movements is where the hackers are getting in, right? So that's what the beauty thing about the, uh, the Uber example is that who would have thought, you know, I've got my multi-factor authentication going in. A human made a mistake. Yeah. We can't, we can't not expect humans to make mistakes. We're, fall, we're fallible, right? Yeah. The reality is, is once they were in the environment, they could have protected themselves by running enough pen tests to know that they had certain uh, exposed credentials that would have stopped the breach. Yeah. And they did not had not done that in their environment. And I'm not poking yeah, the no, tiger but, in the but it's an interesting just, trend though. I mean, it's obvious if sometimes those low end items are also not protected well, so it's easy to get at from a hacker standpoint, but also the people in charge of them can be fished easily or spear fished because they're not paying attention because they don't have to. No one ever told them, hey, be careful of what you click Yeah, for on. the community that I came from, John, that's exactly how they, they would uh, meet you at a, uh, uh, an international event, um, introduce themselves as a graduate student. These are national actor states. Uh, would you mind reviewing my thesis on such and such? And uh, I was at Adobe at the time that I was working on this. And sure enough, you get the PDF, they open the PDF and whoever that customer was launches. And I don't know if you remember back in like 2000, 2000 2008 timeframe, there was a lot of issues around IP being by a nation state being stolen from the United States. And that's exactly how they did it. And John, that's, yeah. Or LinkedIn, Ooh. hey, I, I want to get a job. We want to yeah. hire you, double the salary. Oh, I'm going to click on that for sure, you know? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. The one thing I would say to you is like, uh, when we look at like sort of, you know, because I think we did 10,000 pen tests last year, is it's probably over that now, you know, we have these sort of top 10 ways that we think and find people coming into the environment. The funniest thing is that only one of them is a, a CVE related vulnerability, like, uh, you know, you guys know what they are, right? So it's, it, but it's, it's like two percent of the attacks are occurring through a CVEs. But yet, there's all that attention spent to that, yeah. and very little attention spent to this pen testing side, yeah. which is sort of this continuous threat, you know, monitoring space and and, and this vulnerability space where I think we play a, such an important role. And I'm so excited to be a part of the tip of the spear on this one. Yeah, I'm old enough to know the movie Sneakers, which I loved as a, you know, watching that movie. You know, professional right. hackers are testing testing, always testing the environment. I love this. I got to ask you as we kind of wrap up here, Chris, if you don't mind, the, the benefits to team, professional services from this alliance. Big news, Splunk and you guys work well together. We see that clearly. What, are, uh, what other benefits do professional services teams see from the Splunk and Horizon3.ai alliance? So if you're, a, I think from, from our, our, from both of our uh, partners, uh, as we bring these guys together and many of them already are the same partner, right? Uh, is that uh, first off, the licensing model is probably one of the key areas that we really excel at. So if you're an end user, you can buy uh, for the enterprise by the number of IP addresses you're using. Um, but uh, if you're a partner working with this, there's solution ways that you can go in and we'll license as to MSPs and what that business model on our MSPs looks like. But the unique thing that we do here is this C plus license. And so the consulting plus license allows like a uh, somebody, a small to mid-sized to some very large, uh, you know, Fortune 100 uh, you know, consulting firms use us uh, by buying into a license called um, consulting plus where they can have unlimited uh, access to as many IPs as they want, but you can only run one test at a time. And as you can imagine, when we're going and hacking passwords and um, uh, checking hashes and decrypting hashes, that can take a while. So, uh, but for the right customer, it's it's a perfect tool. And so I, I'm so excited about our ability to go to market with uh, our partners so that we understand, how to sell, understand how not to just sell to or not how just to sell through, but we know how to sell with them yeah. as a good vendor partner. I think that that's one thing that we've done a really good job building, bringing it to market. Yeah, I think also the Splunk has had great success how they've enabled uh, partners and professional services. Absolutely. They, you know, the services that layer on top of Splunk are multifold, tons of great benefits. So you guys vector right into that, ride that wave with friction. Uh, and 
And the cool thing is that in, you know, in one of our reports, which could be totally customized uh, with someone else's logo, we're going to generate, you know, so I, I used to work at another organization. It wasn't Splunk, but we, we did, uh, you know, pen testing as a, as a, for, for customers. And my pen testers would come on site, they, they'd do the engagement and they would leave. And then inevitably someone would be, oh shoot, we got another sector that was breached. And they'd call you back, you know, four weeks later. And so by August, our entire pen testing teams would be sold out. And it would be like, well, I can eat in March maybe. And they're like, no, 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 I got a breach now. And, and, and then when they do go in, they go through, do the pen test and they hand over a PDF and they pat you on the back and say, there's where your problems are, you need to fix it. And the reality is, is that what we're gonna generate completely autonomously with no human interaction is we're gonna go and find all the permutations of anything we found and the fix for those permutations. And then once you've fixed everything, you just go back and run another pen test. Yeah. It's, it, you know, for what people pay for one pen test, they could have a tool that does that every, every pat, patch on Tuesday, pen test on Wednesday, you know, triage throughout the week. Green, it's, yellow, it's red. Cool. I wanted to see the colors. <laughs> Show me green. Yeah. Green is good, yeah. right? Not red. <laughs> Uh, and what yeah. CIO doesn't want, who doesn't want that dashboard, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it is exactly it. And we can help bring, and I think that, you know, I'm really excited about helping drive this with the Splunk team because they get that. They understand that it's the green, yellow, red dashboard. And, and how do we help them find more green uh, so that the other guys are in red? Yeah, and get in the data and do the right thing and be efficient with how you use the data, know what to look at, so many things to pay attention to, you know, the combination of both and then, then go to market strategy real brilliant congratulations chris thanks for coming on and sharing um, this news uh, with the detail around the splunk in action uh, around the alliance thanks for sharing john my pleasure thanks look forward to seeing you soon all right great we'll follow up and do another segment on devops and it and security teams as the new new ops but and super cloud a bunch of other stuff so thanks for coming on in our next segment the ceo of horizon 3aa will break down all the new news for us here on the cube you're watching the cube the leader in high-tech enterprise coverage.